Oh, this is so nice. I mean, it's not even warm yet, but it just, what is it about the sun? <clears throat> anyway, welcome everybody to the Peak District. Now you might remember I said at the end of last year that I'd be traveling a lot this year for this channel. So here we are, sort of 20, 25 miles from my house. That counts, doesn't it? I'm here for two reasons. The first is to tackle my uh, my ever-growing vitamin D crisis, and the second and probably more important reason is to finally do my review of the uh, the Panasonic G9. But then I guess you knew that because you clicked on this video, which which told you that. Let's crack on, shall we? Uh, I've just remembered before we get into the nitty-gritty, a few bits of housekeeping. Um, number one. I am not a professional camera reviewer, I'm, I'm a photographer, and the difference between the two will probably become abundantly clear over the next few minutes, but basically what that means is that I'm not really in a position to say that this camera has a better battery life of X percent versus a Sony whatever, or, or it focuses better or worse than a Fuji, or I don't really know to be honest, I don't test cameras all day, every day. Uh, what I do is use cameras that I think will be good for me, which is why I've got hold of one of these in the first place, because I think this could be my next camera, so Panasonic sent me one to test out so full disclosure there this this might be a bit biased because I actually want to really like this and lastly there was a third thing what was the third thing oh yeah lastly when I've done previous videos about this camera people have asked me all kinds of different things about the features and like could I test this could I test that loads of different really obscure stuff so thanks for getting involved uh, if I was to do a comprehensive test of this camera it would be hours long this video because with all modern cameras the settings and the features if I was going to talk about every single thing it would take days. So I've, I've basically taken the approach that I'm going to talk about this camera and what I think it could do for me and hopefully in turn that will be useful information for you. So what I'll do is I'll link a couple of really detailed thorough reviews in my description uh, in case this video doesn't answer all your questions. But also any comments that you've left as questions on previous videos about this camera uh, I'm going to list in my description. Then if you've got a G9 or you know the answer to some of them if you could help by uh, answering some of those questions in the comments too that would be that would be helpful okay i think that's all the housekeeping uh, okay i'm six foot tall and have sort of quite normal hands i think and this camera the g9 fits those hands like a glove um sadly without the warmth which i could do with it at the moment my hands are freaking freezing but yeah ergonomically this camera i think is a triumph it's comfortably the most comfortable micro four thirds camera I've ever heard, heard, held, and I have no complaints. I mean, it's quite a big camera. It's not all that different in size from my Nikon D50. And since I made a whole video hoo ha and about why I was leaving full frame, partly because of the weight, a lot of people kicked off about that and said, why are you interested in a G9? That doesn't look any smaller than the D750, but it's the lenses. The lenses in any system take up the majority of the weight of that system. So naturally a micro four third system is gonna have much lighter lenses. Uh, my only real ergonomical gripe, as I've mentioned in the uh, the initial thoughts video, which I'll, I'll link here, is the placement of the record button. Um, now a lot of people have pointed out that if you're in manual movie mode that doesn't matter because you can just use the shutter button to start recording but if you're not if you're in another mode and you want to start recording a quick bit of action it's quite difficult it's not difficult but the the record button's not in the ideal place for that so that would probably be my my sole complaint about um the the ergonomics other than that the click wheel the joystick all the function buttons yeah perfect placement also as you might have noticed i'm doing all these pieces with my face fully pointed at the sun I don't know when it's going to be sunny again. Well, it hasn't completely passed me by that I didn't choose the best day to do a camera test on, given that there's not really a cloud in the sky. So um, I've come into the woods, which I'd normally be quite happy about. I like woods, but um, I started watching Stranger Things last week, so I'm a bit on edge. Anyway, I'm going to do a quick low light stabilization test because it's quite dark in here, and, uh, and then I'll move on. I, uh, I wasn't taken away by a monster in the woods, which I see as a positive. Um, I think I probably look like a monster at the moment, but aside from that, all's good. Just need to make a quick potential apology about the sound because if you've watched previous other videos recently, you'll know that I've been having some sound issues. And this, my Rode VideoMic Pro, has now completely shit itself. I recorded this whole thing before and it just stopped working midway through, so. My one. 
That's good. No such problems with the G9 stabilization though. Uh, although this was the first shot I took in the woods, which was a bit spooky as well. But no, other than that, I pretty much didn't struggle at all to get exposures of half a second with a G9, which, I mean, is just incredible. Particularly when you consider I didn't have any lunch, uh, I was really cold, and I was a bit scared in the woods, so I probably wasn't the, the steadiest hand. Now, the claim stabilization for the G9 is six and a half stops, which is one and a half stops more than the G85 that I'm filming this on now. And the G85 stabilization is incredible. I think I'd probably agree that the G9's is a bit better. Uh, I found it more consistent. I definitely didn't have a 100% keeper rate of half a second exposures with the G85, where I did with the G9. But yeah, both iterations of the system are just phenomenal. As far as video stabilization, if you've seen a lot of my videos before, you'll know that I'm no magician for stabilized footage. But the G9, I mean, if you've got the stabilization on and you're just walking along, it's, it's like you're using some kind of gimbal. Um, and I've never used a gimbal, I've just seen, seen footage. It's very stabilized, very, very stabilized. Right, I've, uh, I've come down to a bird sanctuary because I want to test the continuous autofocus. Unfortunately, none of them are flying. I don't know if they usually have Friday afternoon off or something. I... <sighs> Got the electronic shutter ready and everything. Listen to this. They're all raw with continuous autofocus. Ridiculous. 20 frames a second with the uh, electronic shutter or 60 frames a second if you lock focus. Nuts. And uh, if you prefer a mechanical shutter, nine frames a second with continuous autofocus, or 12 without it. It's very impressive. Well, the, uh, the birds aren't flying anywhere, so I might as well just talk about autofocus. Oh, he's, he's going. Um, the G9 has a new autofocus system, depth by defocus. I don't really know what that means, but I think this has got more autofocus points than the G85. And what that means in practice is that it can focus a hundredth of a second faster than the G85. Now the G85 that I'm recording this on now, that's why I keep pointing, is by far the fastest autofocusing camera I've ever used. Uh, and this is a hundredth of a second faster. In practice, I can't really tell. Where I can tell a difference is video. Now sometimes when you're trying to autofocus on the G85, it'll hunt a bit, like it'll sort of semi-lock onto a subject and then it's not really quite sure that it's locked on so it'll go back and forward a little bit. Typically, I haven't found that at all with the G9, which is very good news for video shooters. I mean, I'm not really a cinematic kind of person, as you'll have noticed from my videos, but um, yeah, good news for video people. Uh, now, because this camera shoots up to 20 frames a second with continuous autofocus, I thought that was a little bit of a cop-out and that I needed to do some kind of autofocus test. I couldn't just leave it just because the birds decided not to fly. So I managed to recruit Emily for a very simple continuous autofocus test. Just went along to the local car park and uh, got to walk towards the camera at a fairly brisk pace, which I know is not a particularly difficult continuous autofocus test. But the camera did very, very well. Now, if you're familiar with micro four-thirds cameras, you'll know that two, three, four, five, six years ago, it was inconceivable that continuous autofocus would make up like any kind of meaningful impact on the camera and it's marketing. Now, things are a bit different. I mean, with a mechanical shutter which records at nine frames a second with continuous autofocus or 12 without it, it didn't miss a beat. Like with, with face recognition and tracking, pretty much 100% of the shots that I took were in focus. With the electronic shutter at 20 frames a second, a little bit different. I'd still say sort of 75 to 80% of the shots were in focus, but there were definitely shots that weren't in focus. To be honest, I have absolutely no idea how that compares to other cameras that can shoot at similar speeds. But yeah, certainly for my use, that sort of performance is, is incredible. The other feature that I should probably mention in this segment is the, uh, the 6K pre-focus. So you can record 6K footage and take stills from it at 18 megapixels, and you can record photos before you've even pressed the shutter. So obviously when you press the shutter, you record all the photos after it. But if you've been too slow on the shutter, the camera will also have recorded some, uh, some frames before you press the shutter. Press, press the shutter, which is a cracking feature. I mean, I use continuous autofocus probably once a year, so that kind of feature isn't really for me, but um, it's very impressive. Um, both the G85 and the G9 shoot 4K. The G9 shoots at 60 frames a second 4K, the G85 only shoots at 30 frames a second. Now, to be honest, I don't know why I'm bothering showing you these clips. These are 4K, 30 frames a second clips 
that have been down res to 1080p because this is a 1080p video and then scaled down within the frame as well so you obviously won't be able to tell a difference you'll just have to trust that I with my very untrained cinematic eye I can't see a difference at 4k either but there are a couple of other things if you're a video shooter as well as a still shooter that might tempt you to upgrade from the G85. But the headphone jack and it's got super slow motion or 180 frames a second at 1080p. Which considering this has been marketed squarely at stills photographers is a very welcome feature. My only gripe with it would be that you can't access the super slow motion from the quick menu. And the quick menu is where I make all my settings changes. So that's a bit frustrating. I mean you might be able to somehow but in coming up to three or four weeks with this camera I haven't found a way to do it. So if you want to get super slow motion you've got to dig through the menus or stick yourself in a custom setting but I mean I can live with that. Uh, high res it's an impressive feature there's no doubt about it so basically on the left you can see a 20 megapixel normal still this is just straight out of the camera and on the right is an 80 megapixel still taken from eight images I think where the sensor has just moved a tiny little bit each time and stitched all those images together to give you lots and lots of detail. And there's no doubt there is a definite difference here, at least in these trees. Problem is, if you move down to the water, because this high-res image was formed of lots of different images, those images were taken over a period of a second or two, and over that time the water has moved, and as you can see these birds or ducks, whatever they are, they've moved as well. And this caused me a problem even with images that I didn't think it would. So for example, this is a vista, this is a shot of a landscape basically and it's not particularly well composed I was just playing around but what I didn't notice was that on the road in the pass in the distance there was a lorry and as you can see the lorry hasn't fared particularly well in high res mode but I didn't even notice it before I composed the shot but the trouble is when you're zooming in one to one on an image that's over 10,000 pixels wide, this is the sort of problem you might encounter. So the high res mode, yeah, it's very impressive. Uh, stills live studios or landscapes where absolutely nothing's moving. You know, no water, no clouds, trees aren't moving, uh, no lorries. Otherwise, you're best off just sticking to the, the normal modes. Um, it's definitely not like you're buying an 80 megapixel camera, that's for sure. But for times when you can definitely use it, it's a great added feature. Uh, normal res, okay so here's an image from the G9 on the left and the G85 on the right and the G9 image is a little bit bigger because it's got more resolution, 20 megapixels versus 16 uh, but the file's also a bit crisper I think and I took both of these images on the Leica 12-60 to um, so yeah, overall very impressive upgrade in the sensor and I didn't particularly have a problem with the G85 sensor in the first place so this is a, a very welcome upgrade now some people asked me to do a quick comparison with the Nikon D750 as well which was a bit I don't know I mean I didn't really want to do it just because you can't use the same lenses and therefore you don't know what to attribute to the sensor and what to attribute to the lenses but I was there with the camera so I did and for what it's worth the G9 with the 12 to 60 Leica somewhere in the middle of its zoom range is a little bit sharper than the D750 with the Tamron 24 to 70 I don't know how useful that is Dynamic range, I would say that the G9 is definitely a step up from the G85. Now to give a bit of history, uh, when I first bought this G85, sort of nine or ten months ago, I was so impressed with it that I thought, right, I'll buy a couple more of these and I'll just get rid of all my full frame gear. And then all stills and all video I shoot will be all on the G85. And the only thing that held me back was dynamic range. I did a video about it here or here. I don't know. Somewhere up here I'll link it and it was comparing the D750's dynamic range to the G85's dynamic range and the G85 just, I mean it was nowhere near it really. And so I kept the D750. With the G9 though, I mean it's still not at the levels of the D750 but it's close enough that I know that pretty much 99% of the time the G9 will do me absolutely fine and when it doesn't you know, I'll bracket it or I'll find some other solution. Uh, but it's good enough on the G9 that it's no longer worth me carrying around lots of full frame big heavy gear um, just for the sake of dynamic range because to me and my shooting it's not needed. Uh, low light and noise. Now at this point I was getting some strange looks from the people walking past me and I was just taking pictures of the wall with three different cameras. As you might be able to see from these shots, I don't know if you can, uh, the D750 definitely wins out in terms of noise again but the difference between the D750 and the G9 it's minimal. I mean, you'd have to see the images side by side to stand a chance of telling the difference. There's no doubt that the D750 has less noise at equivalent ISOs, but yeah, it's, it's really not a big difference. Build quality. Um, I'm gonna cut the titles now. I mean, I haven't edited this video yet, but you're probably getting sick of the titles and, and I'm probably getting sick of editing them when I do edit them. Build quality, yeah, so with a pro camera, 
Yes, it has to take incredible images. Yes, it has to be packed full of settings, but it also has to be built like a brick. And that's because you need to use it pretty much day in, day out for years at a time. And previous Micro Four Thirds cameras or previous mirrorless cameras altogether didn't quite cut the mustard in that regard. You know, if you drop them on a rock predominantly, they're gonna break. Whereas with a big pro DSLR, that wasn't the case, they, they generally survive. Uh, with this G9, this is a magnesium alloy body. Uh, it's weatherproof, it's freeze proof. If I dropped this on a rock, I'd be pretty confident that it would keep working, and, uh, and that's a big deal. I mean, I'm not gonna test that, this, this isn't my G9. Um, to be honest, even if it was mine, I, I wouldn't test that, but yeah, it's well built. A few other little things, battery life, this gets about 400, 450 shots per battery. The battery's a bit bigger than in the, the G85. Or in eco mode, it gets nearly a thousand shots in my test, which is great. I mean, mirrorless cameras have always got a bit of slack for battery life in the past, and that's because typically the bodies are smaller, so the battery has to be smaller, but they also need to power an electronic viewfinder, which a DSLR doesn't have to. So battery life has never really typically been all that great. I've never really had qualms with it, I always carry spare batteries, it's, it's not a big deal as far as I'm concerned, you just stick them in a coat pocket or something. But yeah, with this, unless you're shooting heavily, you can go out with just one battery and uh, you should be fine. Viewfinder, I talked about this in the uh, initial video a lot, it's massive, it's brilliant, it's the best viewfinder I've ever used. My only gripe with it really is that in portrait mode, I wish that the information flipped so I appeared at the bottom at the top rather than at the sides in the wrong orientation. That'd be good, I mean I can live with it, but yeah, that would be. That would be great. Uh, dual card slots, again, I've talked about these before. What I like about these card slots is they're both fast. And given how quickly this camera takes pictures, that's imperative. You know, if you're taking 20 or 60 frames a second, those files need to get onto the cards as quickly as possible to clear the buffer. So, yeah, that's very welcome. Night mode's pretty interesting, I think. Uh, basically, it gets rid of all the green and the blue, just leaving red, which means you don't ruin your night vision um, or the surrounding scene with floods of light coming from your camera. So. That's a very clever idea. Uh, the top plate screen, again, I've talked about this before. I was a bit concerned about this when I first saw the photos of the G9. I thought this was just a bit of a hangover from DSLRs, trying to entice DSLR users to buy this camera. And that's maybe the case, but I've been surprised at how much I wanted to use it. I think I forgot how much I used it on DSLRs in the past, and um, yeah. It's been great. And finally, USB charging. Now, on my way home the other day, it's about an hour long drive, and by the time I got home, the battery was fully recharged. Uh, now, I know it's 2018, you probably shouldn't give too much praise for cameras being USB rechargeable, but the G85 isn't, so it's a very welcome step in the right direction, I think. Um, yeah. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my comprehensive not very comprehensive review of the Panasonic G9. If I haven't touched on anything that you wanted to know, as I said earlier, I'll put some links to some more thorough reviews in the description. But yeah, I'm 95% sure this is gonna be my next camera. Yes, it's quite big, but it's packed full of features, some of which I, I probably won't use all that much, but there's buttons everywhere, there's customization everywhere, and best of all, you can use it with really great, tiny lenses. Do I think it's worth an upgrade from a G85? That depends on what you shoot, I think. Only you can tell. For me, the big things are the viewfinder, which is incredible. The size of the body, which is, I mean, it's a big micro four thirds camera, but it's really super comfortable. I really like the sensor, and I like the added video features, obviously, because I do YouTube bits and bobs. Um, so for me, absolutely, it's worth the upgrade. It probably won't be for everyone, but either way, it's a really cracking piece of kit. Uh, but thanks for watching. Thanks very much for your patience if you've been waiting for this review for a while. I just wanted to make sure that I had a good amount of time with the camera before I gave my opinions on it. Uh, but yeah, I guess I should try and find out what the hell's wrong with this. Ugh.